All right, today, ladies and gentlemen, let's discuss sailboat size. It is incredibly, incredibly important to determine the correct size vessel to meet your needs. So today, we're gonna discuss all the factors that you should be considering when buying yourself a new to you, fancy dancy used sailboat so that you can determine what size you actually need and what size sailboat you can grow into versus out of. And when it comes to buying yourself a new to you, fancy dancy used sailboat, we always wanna buy as new as possible and as small as possible. The reason for this is so that our running costs over time to keep the vessel up to speed and all in working order doesn't break the bank. So although we may have enough money to run out and buy a 65 foot mega yacht, not sure if 65 foot's considered a mega yacht, but it's awfully big, but just because we can doesn't mean that we should. Now, let's discuss some very general concepts right out of the gate. 1990s sailboats and prior are incredibly, incredibly small compared to their length overall. And always keep in mind, your length overall is what you're always going to be paying for slips, haulouts, sails, things like that. The longer your vessel overall, the more money it's going to cost you to grab a slip, get sails, because your sail plan's obviously going to be larger, haul the vessel out, do bottom jobs, things like that. It is going to increase dramatically the larger that you go. So to show you some examples of exactly what I'm talking about, we are going to start right here. Now here is my least favorite vessel ever made on the planet, the Pacific Seacraft 40. Now this was first built, as you can see, in 1997. Now she has a length at the waterline of 31.25 feet and a length overall of over 42 feet. That is over a 10 foot discrepancy between your length of the waterline versus your length overall. And again, keep in mind our length overall, that's what we're paying for slips, haul outs, bottom jobs, things like that. With this large of a discrepancy, that means you get a very, very small livable space on board, but a very high running cost. Now, if we go up a little bit newer, let's compare it to the Oceanus 40. Now this obviously comes in a two cabin or three cabin layout, the two cabin one head, the three cabin two head. I used to own this vessel, but she comes in with a length of the waterline of 33.96 feet and a length overall of 39.86 feet. So we're still rocking about a six foot discrepancy there, but it's quite a bit better than this Pacific dumpster. I mean, Pacific sea craft. And if we go newer, Let's jump right up to the Oceanus 40.1. Now this is Beneteau's newest 40 footer. She comes in a two cabin version, a three cabin version, another three cabin version, and a three cabin version with a Pullman berth. That's awfully packing quite a bit in there. But anywho, so she comes in with a length at the waterline of 38.39 feet and a length overall of only 42.22 feet. So now we have a discrepancy here, less than four feet foot indifference that is far better bang for your buck as your livable space on board is incredibly large and it's very very close to what you're going to be paying for your running costs lips marinas and haul outs of that nature so as you can see the older the vessel was first built or built the smaller length of the waterline it's generally going to have versus the length overall as you get newer, your length of waterline is going to get closer to your length overall. And if you buy one that's only about mm, seven years old or so, you're going to get really, really close in your length of the waterline versus your length overall. Incredibly, incredibly important to always pay attention to those two numbers so you can understand what exactly you are getting. All 40 footers are not built the same. All 30 footers are not, 35 footers and so on. Very often, especially vessels prior to about 2010, this little model number, 40, 40.1, 393, 423, and so on, generally speaking, the older the vessel, the less that number actually has to do with the livable space on board. Oftentimes, people will contact me and say, I want to get a 40 footer. Okay, great. But uh, what's your budget? And what years are you looking at? Because if you're looking at a 40 footer from 1995, 
Generally speaking, you'd be much, much better off getting a 35 footer from 2014. You're going to get more livable space on board with your length of waterline and your length overall is going to be far lower, reducing your overall running costs. Very, very important factors to keep in mind when buying your next sailing vessel. Okay, so now that we have the absolute basics of your sailboat sizes, kind of in a way that you can understand them. Your length of the waterline, that's your livable space. Your length overall, that's what you're gonna be paying for your running costs. The older the vessel, the bigger discrepancy between your length of the waterline versus length overall. Pretty simple, right? And keep in mind, those 90s vessels, and more often than not, in general, the actual model number of the vessel can have very little to do with your actual livable space on board. So hopefully you understand that now with that little breakdown. So now that we have that covered up next, we need to take a look at what type of sailing are you actually going to be doing? This is not put on your rose colored glasses and I'm doing a circumnavigation of the globe. This is the real world and reality as far as your budget, time constraints, age, and all those other considerations. What type of sailing do you realistically see yourself doing in, let's say, the next five to ten years? Because you should absolutely be buying a vessel for those needs, not the pie in the sky. I'm going to Antarctica and then Africa. That's a long distance and a lot of money. You need to keep in mind that cruising full time is incredibly expensive depending on where you go. Boat maintenance can be incredibly expensive under the best circumstances, and if you don't really put a lot of thought into what type of sailing you're going to be doing, you may wind up like some of your best YouTubers sitting in a boat yard for years on the hard, refitting your vessel, and if you're like me, you just don't have that kind of time. So let's take into consideration the two basic types of full-time cruisers. Now we have the ocean crossers. Those are the quote unquote blue water sailors. Now, if you see yourself crossing the Atlantic, the Pacific, doing long, long distances like that, the size of your vessel is even more important because when you're doing those long trips, you need to absolutely have a lot of space on board, not only for your personal comfort, but also storage. Yes, somebody's gonna run into my comments and be like, uh, blah, 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 did it on a 30 footer. My dude, I'm a grown man. And if I want to live in a box, I'll just go do that. That is not why I sail full time. I sail full time because I love the sea and the ocean and everything that it has to offer me. I don't do it to be uncomfortable and sacrifice my quality of life to simply try to impress some people on YouTube and say, look at me, I rode across the Atlantic. I don't care, dude. The reality is if you're a grown adult, being uncomfortable is no longer something most of us are willing to deal with. So for these long blue water trips, long distance sailing, Keep in mind, you need to get a vessel with enough livable space on board for a lot of storage. Now, when you go to these other countries and things, a lot of things are incredibly, incredibly expensive. So there's a lot of things you want to be putting on your vessel ahead of time before you get there. So again, that we don't break the bank when we're over cruising in, let's say, Monaco or the south of France, something like that. And there are all kinds of things that you're going to be loading onto your boat. There's going to be maybe fishing poles, paddle boards, kayaks, dive gear, snorkel gear. Who knows? Whatever it is that you're into, it's going to have to go on your boat. And boats get full really, really quick. If we look at our basic lockers on board a vessel, there's not a lot of room. You have enough for a very, very basic wardrobe, a tool set, and some other things. You got food provisioning, things like that. And then you start to run out of space really, really fast. So keep in mind, it's always best to go a bit larger if you're going to be doing blue water sailing because you're gonna be away from land longer and storing more things on your vessel. Now, ideally we wanna go as small as we can, but for you, that may be a 50 footer. It might be a 45 footer. I'm here to tell you, that a 40 footer is not nearly as big as most people think. I just spent a week on the Bahamas on a very nice Juno 409. 
fantastic 40 footer there was four of us on board is that vessel big enough for four people for long full-time blue water sailing absolutely not not in a million years with four people on that very nice 40 footer it was incredibly incredibly jam-packed and i could not wait to get off of that vessel that is far too many people far too many belongings for a vessel of that size so keep in mind if you're a couple with kids go bigger you're going to be much much happier in the long run the way vessels are laid out oftentimes you're going to be bumping into stuff all the time so try to give yourself a lot of extra room if again you're going for the blue water ocean crossing sailing just get a bigger boat make yourself happy in the long run now, the second type of most popular sailing that people find themselves doing is coastal cruising and island hopping. We got the Bahamas, we got the Caribbean, we got El Paradiso. Now, when it comes to that type of a vessel, as far as size, you can absolutely get away with, in reality, quite a bit smaller. You're going to have access to more things more often. You're going to be anchored out close to shore more often than not, especially down here in the Caribbean. So things are just a short dinghy ride away. You forget something, no worries. Pop on into shore, go get what you need. Supply, provision, throw a water maker on there, some batteries, some good solar. You're pretty much set and you don't need a ton of extra storage space. Again, even if you're gonna be coastal cruising and island hopping, still go as big as you can at the same time, going as small as necessary if that makes any sense at all. But by now you should know exactly what I am talking about. So for the Caribbean, coastal cruising, Bahamas, paradise, things like that, even maybe with the occasional ocean crossing, you can absolutely get away with, again, a bit smaller vessel because you've got access to everything. You can run right to shore, you can grab tools, you can grab groceries, you can grab spare parts. If something breaks, if you're cruising down here in the Caribbean, you can often get Amazon shipped right to you, no problemo. So we can get away with a bit smaller of a vessel. In addition to that, when you're down here cruising in the Caribbean, things like that, and you do have access to those things, if you need a break from the boat, it's incredibly easy. Grab yourself a hotel room. Give yourself a weekend break from the boat. Boat life is hard under the best of circumstances. These YouTubers that always show you how everything's so great and they just love life are full of it that's why you always see them breaking up and one of them winds up bawling on camera because boat life is hard and try to make it as easy as possible for yourself fyi sailing youtubers are nonsense and that's not reality and the smaller of a vessel that you go the harder it is going to be in the long run now again that doesn't mean you can't do all of these things on a tiny boat if your budget is small, work within your budget. It's no big deal. You got to get the best bang that you can for whatever your budget is. If your budget's 40K, no big deal. Just get the best boat that works for you. But do understand, if that's the case and you got a bit smaller budget and you want a blue water cruise, you need to understand the cost of blue water cruising. So try to get yourself a bit larger vessel so that you don't increase your running cost by constantly having to run to shore, do haul outs, things like that. Get yourself a larger boat that you can carry extra things on board so you're not having to buy those things in incredibly expensive countries. Now, if you're cruising down here in the Caribbean, your budget's 40 or 50K, that's easy, easy, cheesy to take care of and get handled, no problems. So hopefully this tells you a little bit about what to consider for sizes. Now, if you do like my videos, it is incredibly, incredibly important. Leave a comment down below. Just say hello, leave a thumbs up, share, subscribe, all those good things. It's incredibly, incredibly important for the YouTube algorithm and really, really helps me continue to make daily videos for you guys. So thank you so much once again, and I will catch you on the next video. If you need help getting on the water sooner than later in the most cost-effective and time-efficient manner without getting burned, head on over to my website at chasinglatitudes.com, sign up for a consulting package, and let's get you on the water.
Now, I do want to give a quick shout out to all of my patrons. All my videos are made possible 100% through my patrons. To sign up for my patron, it's only $10 a month, and you do get full access to my private members area with several hundred members all looking to get on the water sooner than later. So hopefully, I will see you on my patron and members area soon. Thank you so much for watching. Don't forget to subscribe, hit like, make sure to leave a comment down below, and turn on those notifications. Thank you so much.